Good evening, everybody, or good morning if you're watching this later on. Welcome to Cross's Corner. I have a fab guest today, Chris Bartley, Olympic silver medalist, Radley rowing coach, and amateur time trial cyclist extraordinaire. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Martin. Thanks. Thanks for having me on and great intro. I sort of sort of feel like I don't quite uh, belong here having looked at the list of other guests you've got. So I'll, I'll do my best to come up with something interesting. But yeah, oh, thank wow. you very much. That's pretty cool. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to say thank you to our sponsors, Ludum, who are a training management and performance analysis tool. And you, you can use that if you're a sports coach or if you're an athlete uh, in a training group. You can start a 30-day free trial as well by visiting ludum.com. And if you want to have a look at Past Crosses Corner, we now have um, an archive of Past Crosses Corner on podcasts on Spotify. So check out that too. But um, Chris, it's, it's, it's great to talk to you today. Um, lots of people want to know quite a lots of things in terms of, you know, your, your illustrious rowing career and so on. Um, I did see some, something today that... Uh, Ian Weir wanted to know what Adam Freeman Pask and Mark Aldred were really like. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to reveal too much, to be honest, but I think I think Pasky, lots of the viewers will, will probably know. Maybe Mark slightly less so, slightly quieter character. But but yeah, I think with the COVID stuff, and I know we we don't want to talk about that too much, I don't think, but that actually cancelled Adam Freeman Pask's uh, stag do, which was probably oh, no. one of the greater losses. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we've missed out on that. So it may be postponed. So that's something to look forward to in the future. Now, you've rode with, with many fantastic um, oarsmen and, and scholars during your life. I mean, who, who stands out for you in particular, of those that you've, you've rode with? Um, yeah, you're right. I think I, I was very lucky to sort of be involved in, in, in a great group of GB lightweight men throughout it, my career from, from the very start to the, to the very end. I think the guy that I've done the most racing with is probably Richard Chambers. Ah, uh, um, another coach. He, he will, yeah, another coach. And that's, that's something that's quite interesting about our group of athletes as well is that quite a few of us have gone on to do coaching which sort of I think says quite a bit about the system that we were involved in and the coaches that we were involved in but yeah Richard we we went through a lot together um we spent a lot of time together not not all of it easy as I'm sure those of you who know Richard will <laughs> will understand um but we had some great times together and we we sort of started our careers at, at exactly the same point at a training camp in Nottingham when we were sort of 20, 21 years old and, and finished it, not in the same boat, but together in, in Rio. And I think um, I certainly learned a lot from, from him and I, I don't know about likewise, but, but perhaps he did. But we, yeah, we certainly, certainly went through a fair bit together. Did, I mean, I guess, you know, because of your size, you always knew that you were going to be involved in lightweight rowing from the get-go. Yeah, so I think, I think I was probably the shortest guy on the team. Um, for probably my whole career, I'd imagine. Was that at King's Chester where you went to school? Right, so I, yeah, I started at started at King's Chester, and uh, I, I it was very fortunate. And I, this is a bit of a theme. I feel like much of it was much of my career has been that I've been in the right place at the right time. So there, I sort of hung on to the coattails of Tom James, who, who Are you were there with TJ. Me. I was, yeah. So I was I was his pairs partner. I, I was tasked with the job of trying to keep him straight <laughs> Bell man. Bell man. yeah 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 most certainly yeah yeah they, I, if he would have had me in the bank if i'd been at straight <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but no he uh, yeah we we had a good time together but i think uh, the selectors soon worked out why that pair was was okay um less to do with me and mostly to do with him i would expect but you know we we had some good times as juniors together it was good yeah yeah so um when you when you got into the squad, I, I presume you followed a traditional route through the under twenty three system and then jumping onto the senior team. Yeah, I did. So I at, at junior level, I raced at the coupe, um, but no no further than that. And then I went off to Nottingham University, where I did four years. Um, 
in my third year, I I made the under twenty three team in a in and raced in a quad, um, which was a part of a project uh, led by Darren Whiter, uh, and another, oh, wow. another guy who sort of has a I have a great deal of thanks to pay to him for for a lot of my career, I, I think, and he he sort of managed that initial project, and then we worked together sort of consistently throughout my career pretty much until until i finished so yeah he, he was a big part of bringing me through that under 23 transition into the senior team and i know i know you spoke to his lightweight women's double uh, uh, a few weeks ago and uh, yeah it was good good to hear him getting a mention there as well yeah yeah darren white has moved over to the women now what would you make of that move uh it's it, it's pretty interesting i mean he he ran a, a pretty tight ship with us lightweight men and we sort of needed a no compromise character to keep us on the straight and narrow i i i think um and it it sounds like they've got a great little project going there and they're obviously doing doing very well off the back of it so it look it looks like that that move has worked very well for him and i'm, I'm really really pleased to see it yeah, I, I mean, when when you look at lightweight rowing now, without lightweight men's four, um, and and just the men's and women's lightweight double, what what, what goes through your mind? Well, I think I, on a personal level, it's like it, it's sad not to see the event that that I was involved in the most not not running anymore. So you you don't see those characters, the, the event that I have the most understanding of, of, of how it's raced and sort of everything that has to go into making that boat go well is, is not there anymore. So, but so personally, I think it's sad, but I mean, I do totally understand the the need for it and the gender parity situation. And this has gone some way to addressing it, which is great, but I, I personally, I sad to see it go, but, pleased to see lightweights have had a had a reprieve for another four years at least yeah no that's good we'll see that we'll see them again at paris won't we mm. um you were never tempted to go on after rio then no i think I'd, i've been involved in the team for 10 years roughly yeah. then and i knew it was my time i'd i'd had enough um i i felt like i'd achieved what and my potential and what I was going to get out of it, um, it was the right time for move to move on for me. And the the loss of the sweep seats um, in the lightweight category sort of put the final nail in my coffin, really, because I I, I wasn't really the most proficient single scholar, if you put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess with your longevity, um, you were always okay on on your weight on what on on 70 kilos or or how how much of a struggle was it for you to to be on that weight i think being on the shorter side always makes it a, a bit easier i mean i was probably stockier than many and i would i would find it quite easy to put on weight in the gym which is was something of a challenge later on in my career when um, as you know, the, the British system has quite a strong emphasis on the strength and conditioning side, yeah, yeah. Uh, the robustness side of things. So we, we did do a lot of weights, which sort of gradually increased my bulk and uh, and it would have to be managed, let's let's put it that way. But I certainly didn't struggle as as much as many do, for, like fortunately for me. Um, but equally, I would probably suffer in not having the lever length and the size to perhaps be able to row naturally as as long and comfortably as some of the guys. So so given what you've said, how come you were in the stroke seat of that great lightweight four then? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I wasn't always there. I was mostly mostly there, I must say. I think um, I, I worked very closely with Rob Morgan, who coached me a lot through uh, my career. And I think I, I, a great deal of our success is how it is down to how he managed uh, us for whoever was in it as people as well as athletes and how he built the boat and how he sort of um, made clear what he wanted it to look like, feel like the rhythm of it uh, and, and what have you. And I think he trusted my temperament really. Oh, 
So I think I think it was a calm head in that seat that was required for that boat at that time, which, which sort of gave me the keys. Um, I think I I wouldn't get sort of phased by anything or react in the wrong way. Whereas some some of the guys in the boat that that some might be more hot headed than me, for example. If we put yeah. <laughs> well, like the Chambers brothers. Well, I, he, he has been known, yeah. Um, but I've got, it was quite good to have those guys behind calling the shots and demanding the sort of intensity required of the training and then let me lead it sort of calmly in the racing. And the, it, it seemed to work pretty well. So, so let's take a look at how that four, how was that four that won in 2010 at the World Championships? How was that, how was that put together? How did that result come about? Because it was quite a remarkable result. Uh, it, it was. So I, I was part of the four in 2009 that, that came 13th, which was sort of a real, real kick in the teeth for me, having the year before come 12th in the pair and then me sort of starting to wonder is this really for me like I've had two two not great results on the trot here like what do I do about it um I think there was a great deal of different stuff that went into that 2010 I think Darren coming in to run the project was a huge part yeah of that Rob being brought in to manage that group of guys in the sweep side was a massive part obviously you have the what is clearly a very successful training program delivered by uh tom uh, paul thompson uh sort of at the top level um but i think it was just a really good team and everyone had really clear roles about what, what part they were meant to be playing in it and and of course you have the you have the athletes, and I think that was true of that. So everyone had a really clear role by the time that project started to form and build momentum. We obviously had some fantastic coaches who I think are sort of not really recognised quite as much as they might be, to yeah. be honest, for the results that they've they've helped guys like me achieve. But then behind that, you've got, support staff who were absolutely at the top of their game and sort of understood what we were trying to do. So we had Alex Wolf come in for the S and C side and he made some really great changes and made made that a huge part of why we thought we were fast. It was like the the lifting and the strength side. That's part of what, what made us what we were. And then obviously uh, another person who who played a big part in in this was our the physiotherapist that we worked with was uh, Liz Arnold and yeah she sort of kept kept me particularly like on the lake and got me to the start line quite often where I perhaps wouldn't have been because I, I think I meant I mentioned earlier like I'm a bit shorter it's a bit of a stretch for me to to row the lengths that are required and I think that sort of stress that I would put through myself quite often would need careful management from from someone like Liz and I think it, each person just had a, a really clear role they were all absolutely unbelievable at what they did and we had all that behind us and, and obviously we did a, a great deal right in the training and the racing and how we bounced off each other and the morale that we formed as a as a team and uh, I think it became really fun and it, it was just a great thing to be involved in and we we really enjoyed it more than more than probably any other season that 2010 season just because it was all quite new to to most yeah. of us and th that was the race was that the race with the incredible photo finish yeah, I think there were there were four boats in however many hundreds of, of seconds, and it it's terrifying to watch it. Really, I, 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 before before this, when you when you asked me to come on, I thought oh, I best I best remind myself of what I used to do. So I had a little watch of some of the races, and it, it uh, honestly it made me feel quite sick. Like it was what, it was what, hard to watch. What do you remember about that race? Then you're on the start. 
what are your expectations being on the start and um you know how how did that race progress for you down the course so i think absolutely we were we were there to win uh we we'd won the world cup series um whether we were favorites or not i don't know but we felt like we had had it in us to win so that was that was myself richard chambers rob williams and paul paul matic uh, in that race um uh, I can remember it pretty vividly because ca- the conditions at Carapiro were variable. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so it wasn't the nice. It wasn't the nicest sort of conditions that you would choose to row in. So straight away, there's a there's a challenge there and a distraction and sort of how you deal with it. Um, or, or has a has a big big factor in how how the result plays out. But I I remember being particularly nervous and thinking this 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 is sort of could be the opportunity for me to change the path of my career because like I said yeah. I've had a couple of years where things haven't gone so well like I can't mess this up now yeah. so so nerves nerves played a big part for me like I would get get pretty nervous before racing and that one especially was was a big deal for me yeah um, I think we didn't have the best start, and I, I just remember sort of thinking, "This is absolutely crazy! Like, there's so many boats all over the lake. It's it's just it's just bonkers. Everything's changed. Like the lead's changing. Yeah, are, yeah. Are we going to win? I, like it, you sort of think you, you don't want to think about the result halfway through, but it, of course it sometimes comes into your head. And I think going into that last two fifty, we just managed to put our noses ahead and in sort of the frantic like charge for the line where you're i don't know sort of mid 40s in the in the rate and it's like obviously it's hurting like hell at at that point and then i just remember sort of having a little look around which i i mean oh really like not not i mean i'd probably be famed for maybe having my eyes out of the boat a bit a bit too much Uh i think uh um, I can just remember looking across and seeing this this Chinese bow like just plowing through the field at, at an absolute rate of knots and and sort of trying to calculate in my head like how far away from the finish line are we and and then we crossed the line I think we sort of knew we'd won even though it was oh, seven, really? seven hundredths of a um, of a second like I sort of felt we'd done it and then the relief of the relief of it as much as the joy i think is there um but to win a to win a medal would have been absolutely unbelievable for me on a yeah. on a personal level i knew that probably wasn't enough for the for the guys in the boat who'd done it before so richard and paul had won in 2007 so this was their sort of second crack at it was for me it was it was the first go and it could have been my last so it it, it it meant a great deal to cross that line first and sort of confirmed to me that I was following, following the right path really with, with what I was doing with rowing is trying to make it my, my job sort of. So yeah, where, that was- where do your medals stand? The world gold, the world gold medal and the Olympic silver in your sort of, is there a, is there a pecking order or? I think um, that, that, World Championships one was very special. Um, not not everyone can say they're a world champion, so to, oh, no. to have that um, on my CV as such was was a huge thing. The Olympics it, it, it's another step up for me, I think, and and partly is that that that's the home games uh, element of it, and and this is where I sort of very few people have that opportunity to to race at a home games and yeah. I, again i sort of felt right place right time sort of situation for for me um but the, the olympics it, it it has to be a, a step above i think and then that that home games element obviously adds even more to that so j- just take us through the 2011 through to that preparation for for 2012 you go into that 2011 season as as world champions it's pre-olympic season so tw- yeah 2011 was a a difficult one for me to be honest i i spent a bit of time out of the boat around world cup three which was lucerne 
um, and Peter Chambers came in to replace me for the for the race. And I, I remember being at Bisham Abbey doing my doing my rehab and and thinking oh, I'd, I'd best like tune in and then <laughs> sort of have a look at the the times. And I'm like, oh, what's going on here? And and they've they've won the heat and then they won the final by basically clear water and I'm thinking oh no this this isn't this isn't so good and 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 suddenly Peter who was sort of keeping my seat warm has staked yeah. a real claim here to 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 take it and rightly so like he did a did an incredible job and it's sort of it's quite strange to think now actually I I was best man at his wedding shortly after Rio so we're we're like really great friends um but at the time it was like oh there's a there's a threat on the car oh, yeah, yeah i'm sort of panicking um because there's nothing i can do like I, I couldn't row i had a had a bad back i was out of boat um and it's sort of a difficult situation to deal with um i think i, I was selected for the world championships in place of peter who raced in the pair uh, at bled in 2011 um very successfully for him they they won yeah the I that. it was obvious that there was quite a lot of talent in that boat with him and kieran emery um and then we sort of had a really good heat really good semi and then the final we just never really got going so it was it was sort of 500 meters and we're in sixth and the, like the, the first 500 would be we might not be the fastest but we'd always put ourselves in the race as a, yeah. as a result of that that strength training that we'd done and we felt and it's sort of you go through that start sequence and you sort of have a little glance out and you think oh this is not going so, so well here we're in sixth but that was never the plan and and i think that the last five last thousand of that race is is probably one of the best sort of salvages that, that we've ever done. Like it, it, I've not, I've not looked at the splits for a, for a while, so I couldn't tell you exactly, but I'm sure that last thousand was, was sort of rocket fast to like drag ourselves back onto the, the podium and, and uh, yeah, rescue something of a, of a result out of it. Um, so it, that was sort of quite interesting coming off the back of 2010 and, yeah. and, and winning world cup series winning, winning the worlds and then you sort of have one year out from the Olympics and and a medal certainly was not not to be sniffed at in that event but it wasn't wasn't where we wanted to be and it was it was sort of obvious going into Olympic year that there were going to be a, like a decent group of athletes fighting for four seats and it was sort of the pressure was on really how tough was that selection process for you so very very tough for me personally because I think a lot a lot of the year was spent in single skulls um, oh. and it was sort of yeah yeah which difficult for me um, because it, it would sort of be a there'd be celebrations around the crew room if I wasn't like bottom of the sheet basically <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's quite hard to rose uh, sort of seven eight months of the year getting your head kicked in week in week out in the single when when really you're you're vying for a place in the in the sweep crew yeah. like it feels it feels quite different and it, there's certainly good good reasons for doing it that way but i would always feel like oh, i need to i need to be sweeping that's that's what yeah. I'm, that, that's what i'm going to be racing in someone let me near the pair or let me in a four and get me out of this single please so yeah, that made it very challenging. And then as a result of sort of fairly mediocre results in the single, I'd I'd have to fight my way through any pairs, matrices, or fight my way on the ergo into a sort of vaguely respectable ranking. And what then, would your PB on the erg? Um, so I did I did six eleven, maybe I don't know, four or five times. Yeah. I think so not 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 outstanding seeing some of the scores that are coming out now but I think I had pretty pretty good consistency about my performances generally yeah, so yeah, I could yeah. sort of knock that out or near enough not maybe not every time but mostly uh and I could also do it at weight which was oh. quite a strong um sort of card that I had like I wouldn't I wouldn't drop off performance a great deal when we yeah. got down to 
to 70. So that that was something that gave me gave me quite a bit of confidence about about trying to secure a seat in that Olympic boat. So you you must have come into the games. I mean, you, you must have had a fantastic training camp because you you were flying coming into London. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we were and we did. We had a we had a super work camp in Bryjack, uh until the last day uh, of it. We I think it was literally the last day, the last piece of work we were doing. Sort of a if not a speed order, certainly a two k, like pretty pretty full full gas and towards the end of it I just felt like that something wasn't quite right with my back Ooh. um so I, I flew home early from that camp like a couple of days before the rest of the team um had some interventions on my back so I was actually out of the boat for maybe 10 days before oh. prep and taper camps and uh this is again where I have sort of the team that we've got behind us to thank for get getting me to the start line um, yeah. and uh that was difficult uh to cope with actually um i sort of not feeling responsibility but looking at that silver medal i just think would if i hadn't missed that period would would we perhaps have had enough to turn that silver into gold and i i, I really don't know but like you say, looking at it another way, we we did come in pretty fast to that uh, to the Olympic Games. So the the heat we rode, I think it was five forty nine. Yeah, in pretty slack conditions, and it, it that sort of indicated to me that thing things were going pretty well, and we had a we had a pretty good chance here. And that yeah, it was it was very exciting to finish that race and see the times and see where we were, and it's like all all that work and and what have you to get me to the start line has paid off, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. And the, the thing around that final, you know, the, the thing I remember that what, watching that was I, I thought, right, these guys are going to win. And then the thing around the final was that the, the lane should have been shifted and moved. The lanes were unfair in terms of the weather conditions. And that was a big deal with me. And I remember doing an interview with, I think it was with Pete. And it was straight after. It was a hot interview. So it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And and he was, um, I think, rightly critical of, of what happened with the lanes. Um, but, I mean, to me, that's why you haven't got a gold medal. Mm. I don't know. I don't know what your take is on that because you're probably because you're quite balanced in most things you say. So you'll probably have a different take. Yeah. No. I I am balanced. I think I think it's a really tricky one because you 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 don't want to make excuses and we we did train to sort of deal with anything that was thrown at us and it, it, we wanted our it, it didn't we wanted it to be that we could could have won without everything going perfectly right um and we didn't so i think we we do take re responsibility for that yeah have it having said that um and i i absolutely take nothing away from that south african crew like they were yeah. they were obviously inc incredible and that that sprint that they put in that it, we've seen it before and they've obviously worked and worked and worked at that and it it paid off for them but uh, I think if if you'd asked any any athlete in that in that race which, which lane would you want to be in, uh, I think we'd know probably what the answer would be, and that yeah. would be the, the the slightly more sheltered one. And, how, and uh, how how good was your performance in that final? I mean, you obviously won the heat, you won the semi. How good was your final row? So pretty good. I, I just I just remember sitting on the start line and and feeling the wind and thinking this this start is going to be horrible. I've got the rudder jammed on towards bow side to sort oh, of wow. stop the bows getting getting pushed round and and uh, we got out the blocks and and obviously the Danes led us by like a length, which is huge in the yeah, in the yeah. Weight four. so. They probably did a better job than we did of that first thousand, and then we really fought our way and and sort of 
it was like willpower and and absolutely absolutely everything we had to to deliver in that second thousand and row them down and then we we just couldn't account for what the south south africans pulled out in the in the last 200 meters and i, I think personally i don't have any regrets really about about how i rode it like i was i was so so ill afterwards i i couldn't i couldn't have got any more out out of it i think the rhythm was good technically it was good it was hard because it was slow um but i i'm happy with what what we delivered it just wasn't quite quite good enough on that day unfortunately did you have did you enjoy your second week of the games or was that difficult to to maximize you no i did we we made a a decision to really enjoy that medal um and i th i think sort of once i'd stopped being sick um and <laughs> recovered after the uh, the medal ceremony like to to row over the lake and we sort of stood up and and applauded with the crowd and it like that sort of set the tone for us like it it was a huge deal and and i know we're all very proud of it um i think had we sort of had our chins down that we hadn't quite done what we wanted or um sort of felt felt bad about it like that wouldn't have been right and it didn't feel right so so we we did enjoy the second week. I watched all sorts of sports. Did some did some partying. Had some beers. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It it would be it would have been wrong to not make the most of what was what was a, an amazing occasion for for London and and the UK. How do you make sense of the next Olympiad? Because you know you 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 were silver medalist in London. You were won the B final. Came seventh in Rio. I think you had. Did you have? Did you medal in twenty fourteen? Is that uh, right? Yeah, in in Amsterdam we got the bronze. Yeah, um, I think it was. Yeah. So um, it, it it's I I didn't quite understand why you weren't just slightly more up there, particularly with the personnel you had. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest. I think it's it's difficult in that. That, that championship in Amsterdam, we we rode five forty three, I think it was in the semi. That's insane. That's um, insane. Which was sort of I don't know a couple of seconds under the world record. Yeah. But of course, the the Danes that were also in our semi went slightly faster than us. <laughs> they they now hold that that record. But I, yeah, I mean, we obviously weren't slow. I think is is what I'm saying, but. Yeah. I think the quality of that event and the, and the guys in all of the boats is is so very high. Not not much has to be wrong to to sort of not be quite on the pace. And and of course, everyone who's behind you, all the nations that that you might just sort of take care of in one Olympiad, they will work out how to get it right. And I think yeah. that, that's what happened. We saw with the Kiwis. We saw with the Swiss. <laughs> Um, there's so, just some some incredible crews came through, and I think just put you on your back foot. You start to question maybe is the rhythm right? Should we be rating higher? Should we change our training? Are we doing anything wrong? And I think probably not. Stick to your. We should maybe stuck to our guns more and 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 trusted in what we were doing, and we may have had a different result. But I think I don't think we did anything too wrong in particular it's just that there were so many other crews that were were so good do you think that's one of the best olympiads for lightweight men's rowing the, the rio olympiad i think i mean personally i'd say no but <laughs> <laughs> i think i think that that swiss four it, like if if you watch how they're rowing it's yeah it, just so it, it's so good and difficult to be i think the danes were always an exciting prospect um the french would always have something yeah. the germans won in the world championships before the kiwis would be absolutely rocket fast in the world cup series um there's just so many crews to to sort of choose from and and some of the racing was was really good um it's just we weren't quite at the sharper end of it for that 
that Olympiad and and uh, so, so how was the Olympic the rest of the Olympics for you after that result? So in Rio, yeah. So very different um, from London, certainly. Culturally, of course, it was it was a world apart and and great fun. Um, it it. I, I knew I was finishing my rowing career. So yeah. sort of my mind was a, a little bit elsewhere maybe, whereas before I might have thrown myself into the sort of enjoyment part of it. I sort of had one, one eye on, right, what, what am I going to do now? What's coming, what's coming next? So it was sort of like a bit melancholic, I guess, uh, would be the feeling. Yeah, uh, not that we didn't have a good time and and enjoy ourselves, but on, on a personal level, I I knew things were going to change quite a lot for me. Yeah, that's interesting. And and a lot of people say that if you ha if you don't have a medal, you haven't got currency in the second week. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, you sort of flash a flash an Olympic medal at a at a bar or something, then you the chances of you getting a free drink are, are sort of yeah. increased, but. I mean, I, I think I, you, you know me. I'm sort of quite, quite quiet. I was, I've always yeah. been quite, quite shy. I think, uh, like a bit, bit more reserved, maybe not, su not super extrovert. Um, and that kind of suited me, not to, not to have too much attention and sort yeah. of yeah. quietly yeah. go about my business yeah. a bit more. <laughs> Did you know when you when you stopped rowing that you would turn to cycling? Was that always an option for you? Um, I I knew I enjoyed uh, bike riding. So we, uh, as a lightweights and women's team, we we did a lot of uh, cycle training camps. So we would go on yeah. camp. in the winter. We would do maybe I don't know a ride a ride a week or a ride every two weeks. And I just I, I really enjoyed it really enjoyed sort of looking after the bikes and like watching cycling as a sport and, and, and ever since I've got, got quite into it. Um, I didn't know that I would want to compete or anything really. Yeah. Um, but who, sorry, who was the fastest on those camps then? Were you, are you <laughs> with your expertise? Were you at the front all the time? Well, I, I'd always put quite a lot of thought into my kit and buying the lightest, bike whatever bike brakes or bike wheels or, or whatever but I, it wasn't always the case i remember my my first camp in cyprus in in 2006 so it, we're going back a bit we yeah did a time trial on the last day and my my sole aim was not to get caught by elise laverick <laughs> 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 she she had a serious engine on the on the bike and, and i remember being set off last man last man out of the lightweight men and Elise was the first woman I think and and I, I didn't get beaten by her and it was it was a hugely you know, like triumphant finish to that that camp for me so I think no I haven't I haven't always been particularly fast at it I, I enjoyed it and I've put quite a bit of work into it since and I sort of gradually got quicker but it wasn't maybe something that was like really natural to me as a sport I don't think so it's interesting when you you say you've put quite a lot of work into it because I I've been re I read a couple of interviews that you've done with with cycling magazines mm -hmm. and you talk a lot about your kit in those cycling magazines <laughs> yeah and which is interesting but also about the the program that you set for yourself and and when you work hard and when you don't work hard mm. I think uh, it, as an it, when being an athlete it was your job you sort of have a pretty good understanding of what endurance training you need to do to be good at a specific specific length event so in in the time trials that i do it would be 10 miles 25 miles or 50 miles and i think it it would just come very naturally to me to go all right this day i i fancy doing that that's probably going to be quite good for that distance i wouldn't be too specific about it but it's something that was came quite naturally to me and something that I really love to do like I love to train I know you look you're the same you 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 need that fix of exercise and I think yeah 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 <laughs> riding gave me gave me that excuse almost so 
yeah, I do, I do invest quite a bit of time and, and unfortunately cash into it as well. Oh. The stuff doesn't come cheap, but I think it, it pays me back in sort of good, good mental health and uh, it makes me, makes me feel good uh, doing that sort of training and, and investing into it. What's the, what's the kit you're using at the moment then, just in case any techie cyclists are watching or will watch? <laughs> Oh, I don't. I don't want to send anyone to sleep. Uh, <laughs> this stuff's so boring. <laughs> um, well, I ride a I ride a time trial bike with the sort of the bars close together at the front, um, like uh, you will have seen Bradley Wiggins winning that that road TT on in um, in 2012. So sort of similar style bike to that, and then that's paired with a disc wheel and a sort of deep section front to help with the aerodynamics that the tire choice is quite key because rolling resistance plays a big part in yeah in sort of how fast you go i've got like a big chain ring on which helps helps with the chain line and drivetrain loss and then sort of a super super fabricy skin suit that's had i don't know all manner of r d put into it to try and reduce the drag of the body and uh i can I can feel everyone sort of dropping off at home now as I go into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find it all really interesting because that the time trialing is it's more than just who pushes hardest. It's it's who can reduce all the the aerodynamic drag or that that rolling resistance or whatever, and and how you apply your effort affects how fast you go. And like I'm quite a numbers nerd. I I, I really enjoy that sort of thing, and some people really hate it, but that. I really find it very interesting. Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think, um, it, it, like I said, I'm not I'm not super strong as a as a rider, and And I think Chris has just frozen there. So I think hopefully he will come back in and go back out again. Um, here he comes. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Hi, Chris. <laughs> I don't know where I was then. I think my Wi-Fi just went down. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it, 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 the time trial, it's, like I said, it's more than, more than just pushing hard and, and trying to reduce your, your drag is such a, sort of nuanced thing like you can you could save sort of 10 watts of drag by altering your position slightly but you might lose five watts of power Ooh. so that therefore is a net gain or you could change your position so you gain 15 watts of power but you might lose 20 watts of drag so you get a, a, a net loss and it's sort of you have to put quite a lot of effort into working out these compromises and where you're sort of sweet spot sits and then you have to train it and then you have to apply it to whatever race or course it is that you want to do well at and then that's a whole sort of another can of worms really have you been in a wind tunnel then uh yes i have yeah yeah so i went uh chris boardman had had a, a training center with a with a wind tunnel and a, and a bike shop underneath and i, I went there a, a few years ago and it was it was honestly the best day out I think I've ever oh. had. <laughs> so, oh, that makes me sound like such a loser, I think. But <laughs> I, I really, really enjoyed it because you, you could you'd do a run in the tunnel and you get a, a drag number, then you could change a helmet or you change a suit or you change your position and you get another number and you get sort of a, something really quantifiable that then you can then take out and like e either predict a course time based on what target power you you want to you want to put out or um and yeah I, I just absolutely loved it so i've got this great big report of all the different positions that i tried and and, and all of that side of things and and yeah it was it it was great um unfortunately now lo lots of people have access to that sort of thing so that sort of times that people are doing is it's absolutely bonkers for 10 miles and 25 and 50 like it's there's some crazy stuff going on in the in the world of time trialing now which uh, it, i mean it's a pretty acquired taste to, to be honest honest to watch and 
and take part in like it's a very traditional sort of sort of scene where you get you get changed in a car park at a village hall you you meet a group of other old men and they pin your number on for you and, <laughs> and that sort of thing and then you go and thrash up and down the dual carriageway and and afterwards you have tea and cake and <laughs> it's been quite it's been quite a good scene for me to be involved in and feel feel part of something else that's still sport but a, a little bit different yeah and are, are you racing close to i mean what sort of weight do you race at now so I'm I'm pretty similar to what I was as a as a lightweight. I don't I don't do any weights anymore. Um, I I probably should, but just time really um, yeah. stops me it stops me doing those. Like I'd I'd rather get my hit of aerobic work or or I don't know hammering a session on Zwift or something. Um, so I'm pretty similar, sort of low seventies, like occasionally dip to seventy, but I've lost a lot of bulk up up top like arms shoulders yeah up yeah, yeah i've got a core of jelly now <laughs> in comparison <laughs> um and then my legs are vaguely useful but but no everything else is sort of withering <laughs> yeah you mentioned swift how how much are you are you on that and and what's your thoughts on jason osborne <laughs> well I, I i listened to your interview with jason and i sort of followed his progress pretty closely yeah he's a I mean, he's he's a, a different league when it comes to cycling. Like the, the, oh, num really? the, the numbers that he puts out, it, it's crazy. And I would, I wouldn't even in my prime during rowing training, I wouldn't wouldn't be anywhere near him. He's it, it is absolutely unbelievable what what he does. Um, the, the Zwift has been a sort of lifesaver for me. The the lockdown because you can you can train on there with other people without having to leave your your house you can race on there against other people and there's a real sort of sense of community about it as well as it being quite fun and quite good training there's like you can enter a race series every week where you you join a team and then you chat over discord and you sort of come up with your race plan and whatever and uh yeah, I've, it's been really good for me, and I, I've really enjoyed it, and sort of kept kept me on the straight and narrow when when I couldn't do my job, which is which is rowing coaching. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been a good platform. Yeah, oh, we, we, we'll talk about your rowing coaching in just a bit now. Just in, in terms of the, the cycling and the training, do you train on pulse rate bands in terms of your sessions, or are you looking at the numbers revolutions, or I mean, what sort of what sort of data are you using when you know to regulate your training? So I, I use a power meter to sort of assess uh, zones. So I mean, zones are generally set based on your FTP, which would be your, your functional threshold power, roughly what you can do for an hour, and then you'll have a have a sort of series of zones above or below that. And a sort of classical rowing UT two would be. A zone two band, which would I, I don't know about about seventy percent max heart rate somewhere around there, and then that'll be your main aerobic training, which is of course where where rowers would train as well as endurance cyclists, and then it, you sort of have a smattering of of training elsewhere, and and of course the heart rate zones would match up to power zones, and it's it's very easy to sort of monitor progress if if power's going up, heart rate's coming down, probably probably going better or you're overtraining one of yeah, the two. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that's that's something else that I, I find fascinating really and that's that's a part of the coaching that I really enjoy is sort of using all that kind of information to to plan programs and sessions and what have you and use use my experience of cycling and rowing to try and make the rowing coaching that I do better. So how's how's that work with you? I, I know because you're your first eight coach at Radley this year. So uh, yeah, I've been drafted in as uh, sort of I don't know Matt, like filling some big shoes of John Gearing, who's yeah. been been pulled to Caversham to to try and help qualify the pair, which I I, am, I have my fingers crossed that they will do. Um, but I have coached at Radley previously for sort of four years so since since I retired uh, early 2017 I, I started there as an external coach working with the senior squad he helping John basically and uh, coaching the second day coaching the first day like do doing a bit of everything 
Um, I also work at Reading University, which was the first job that I took on after my retirement. So that it, the sort of first year post rowing, I really wanted to be a year off where I worked out what I wanted to do. And I took on a part-time role at, at Reading University, um, not too many hours a week because I just, I wanted some flexibility. Like I think the yeah. real thing for me would be to go into something really structured with a, with an like a nine to five or, or a whatever, where I was sort of told where to be and when, and I, I felt like mentally I wouldn't have been able to cope with that. And I wanted to feel like I was in charge of, of my time a bit more. Um, that was going to be for a year and we're sort of five years later and I'm doing the same, the same. <laughs> so, so I'm, yeah, I'm part-time at, at, at Reading University, which is great. We've got a great, great team there and, and we've had some really good success as a, as a sculling squad. So they, they only scull at, at Reading, which was yeah. interesting for me, knowing my personal thoughts on, <laughs> on the single, uh, I do a bit at a bit at Radley, and then I, I mentioned at the start. I think I do I do a bit of work at a bike shop in Henley as well, which sort of keeps me keeps me in touch with that that interest. Um, but at the moment, it just means I'm I'm really busy and I don't have have any time at all. Oh uh, well. So so, so uh, talking about your Radley job, I, I mean, how's it been with? the lads and and uh lockdown and covid and uh you know what are they what are the guys in the first eight looking forward to this year so i think it's i mean it goes without saying that it's been really hard and really challenging i can't imagine going through this period as a sort of 17 18 year old guy or girl like it they've missed such a huge chunk of what should be the most exciting a time for them as people as well as athletes yeah. uh, like they've gone 18 months maybe without a race and it, it it's just crazy and and now starting up again where we've had fixtures and and stuff it's just so exciting to to see them going somewhere different and racing a crew or having a crew come to us and and do some racing but the period of the lockdown that i was involved with heavily with them was sort of january to i don't know late late march i guess and and trying to create a community where we could train together online was quite a quite a challenge for me because it, it, it's something that you don't you don't think you're going to be doing when you take on a job like that you think you're going to have the guys in front of you and you you're going to be able to interact and get to know them but it was sort of chucked into this online world of where you have to work out what you're doing and and yeah, it was a real challenge, but I think we did a good job of it. The guys would show up to Zoom Ergos, which I know, I know you've uh, you've been a part of and looked yeah. at. And it, it it was great, and I think we've learned a lot about about training and and how to do it. But it has just made coming back together even even better. So being down the boathouse and seeing the guys rowing, uh, seeing them having a laugh, and being able to enjoy it with them has has been huge and it, it, it didn't come soon enough really but yeah interesting but good and what are your thoughts on the juxtaposition of Henley and the junior championships this year and how's how's that if if at all going to affect you I think it, it is it's difficult um because you're sort of asking asking kids to make a decision between club and and country and it's I don't feel like we can make that decision for them. We do have trialists who will be going to trials and and who knows really how they will do. I think that's one of the difficult things about the job at the moment is I honestly don't have any idea how fast these guys are in, in their eight, yeah. in their pairs, in their four. So it's sort of all up in the air really as to whether we'll lose guys who might get to Junior Worlds or Coop or... Um, I think it's just too uh, too early to say, but the fact that there are races on at all, I think it's I think it's great. Yeah. I can't wait to get get going, yeah, cool. and I'm sure they feel the same. I think. Yeah, and where's, is the first big race for you national schools? Yeah, amazingly, yeah. So it's sort of going in pretty cold, really. We we've we've had a fixture with Hampton, um, 
which was great. We've got a couple more fixtures for Radley organised, but there won't be actual six-lane racing or eight-lane racing for those guys before we line up at national schools. And I mean, as a coach, that makes me quite nervous, but <laughs> you, can, you can only do your best, can't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, thinking slightly broader, you, you know, you mentioned the women's lightweight double who uh, got a medal at the Europeans. Uh, what, what are your thoughts, wider thoughts on the British rowing team's performance this season and, and hopes, hopes for the Olympics? I thought the Europeans were outstanding, to be honest. I, I think there were, I don't know about surprising results, but to see that, that men's eight pull one out and, and beat the Germans with like a pretty young crew generally. Yeah, yeah. Really good. Um, yeah, I thought, I, thought it was, I thought it was really successful. And I mean, it must give them a great deal of confidence that they've, they've done, a, done a lot did, right. Did yeah. you coach any of those guys? No, no, no. You can't take credit for them. I know there's three guys from Radley in the boat. Yeah, no, I oh, know that's all uh, John Gearing's work, that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, are you hopeful about the Olympics? Um, I think it, it's hard to say, isn't it? I, I think uh, as an athlete, you have this vision of what you expect the Olympics to be like. Um, it, 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 in terms of people being able to watch it. And I think that's going to feel quite different. Um, it, it, it's so hard to predict, isn't it? At the yeah. end of the day, your your job is to go and you're there to race and sort of the other stuff is when you cut it down a, a little bit irrelevant. Like you want to have your opportunity to put in your best performance against all those other people that have, are trying to do the same thing and your result is what matters but the other stuff is what makes it even more special and i think yeah. it yeah it'll be difficult i'm sure for the it, for it to feel quiet almost i don't know it, it, it's so hard to say isn't it martin i think yeah 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 i think it's it's going to be an olympics like no other if it goes ahead and mm. um you know uh, lots of covid tests only moving between one venue and, and the competition venue. Uh, mm. No going outside to Tokyo, um, coming straight home after the event, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, it will, yeah. it's a real, real challenge for everyone, I'm sure. And, and what about you? You, may, you know, you've, you've got these three careers and a fourth if you put in amateur cycling in there. <laughs> uh, do you ever... Do you ever think about where you might be in five years time or or so that's a good question <laughs> i think um at the moment we're 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 between houses so I, we i we moved from henley uh, 18 months ago tried tried to buy a house and have failed ever since oh no so, first of all i'm looking forward to having somewhere that I can call home and, and, yeah. and the base and sort of settle, settle down properly. Um, in terms of the coaching, I, I absolutely love what I do. It's so, yeah. it's so varied. So I have, it, it, so this morning I was out and it was 6.30, sun was shining, the water was flat. Um, I had a great quad that I was able to go and do some work with just to paddle um, and then come in and sort of discuss the session and and on all the things that are, that make coaching such a great a great thing to do working with young people. And this afternoon I was up timing timing pieces in the pouring rain at Radley <laughs> with a completely different group of people and and uh, I've just got quite a varied sort of existence at the moment and I I, I really like it. It's it it's felt like what I needed after such a long period in the in the rowing team I'm sure sooner or later I'll have to settle down with a proper job um, quite quite where that is and what that is I'm I'm not sure but at the moment I I'm, I'm enjoying enjoying what I'm doing yeah well that that's wonderful to hear Chris we've been we've been chatting for almost an hour now I don't know whether you've changed your opinion about whether you are a deserving crosses corner guest <laughs> 
I don't, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I hope I've said some interesting stuff. I've, I've really enjoyed it, actually. It's been, I, thanks so much for having me on. I think I could probably talk about time trialing for another hour on its own, but I wouldn't put you through all that. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it, it's nice to relive some of those memories. And I think I've, uh, I'm sure I've done a, a great many people a, a disservice here by not, not mentioning them, especially that, that lightweight group of guys that we had sort of involved from 2005 to 2016 that, that was a huge part of my life and and many of them are, are still my great pals now so I, it, they'll know who they are and yeah. then the team behind it like I like I said at the start was was just great and it was a a great time to be part of that setup so it, it, it's really nice to Sort of go, yeah. go through it all and and relive a bit of the stuff that I'd maybe maybe not thought about. So yeah, I know. Thanks for having Chris, me. On. Thanks, Chris. I just I'm gonna just inflict one more question on you on. in terms of after Paris, lightweight doubles goes out of the Olympics. What's the future for lightweight rowing? That's a a really good question. I think. One of my favourite regattas ever is the Bucks regatta. And I think it may be the biggest biggest regatta in the country in terms of number of people, number of participants. And, and it, part of the reason it's so good is just the variety of events that are on offer. So you've, yeah. got, you've got lightweight everything, you've got championship everything, you've got inter everything, you've got beginner. Uh, this year we've got beginner one and beginner two for Reading. So there are just tons of different people all enjoying representing their club and the lightweight side of that is huge because there are, there are guys and girls like, like me who aren't six foot five and yeah. pulling six minutes or six forty for the girls on the ergo who, who have an event there and have something to work towards. And I, I'd hate to see that, that taken away. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So fingers crossed. We, we keep it and and as you know i mean the the racing is is very exciting as a as a result of the weight restriction yeah, so yeah. everyone likes to see a close race sort of no matter how fast the people are going so i yeah i i hope it stays in at a at a grass grassroots and sort of national level and if it peters out at international level then then so be it but i'd hate to see it see it disappear totally great answer Chris, we'll end the live part of this interview now, but just to say you've been an absolutely outstanding guy to chat to, a wonderful guest. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, Martin. I, I really appreciate it. It's been great to chat. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.